So good morning, everyone. We're so delighted that you could join us today to talk about this very important topic. I'm Audrey Houlihan, and I'm CEO here at Our Ladies Hospice. And just before I cover some of my thoughts on the day, uh, I just believe I have to do some housekeeping rules. So the exits are clear for you both to see on my left and right. And I think everybody will have passed bathrooms en route. So one of the most important things now, so everybody gets maximum benefit from the discussion, is that everybody, if you can, turn your mobile phone off. We understand that everybody has busy lives, so if someone has a call to take, if you wouldn't mind just slipping out quietly if it's during the course of the discussion. So look, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all here today to our inaugural conversation on the topic of dignity in death. We're so delighted to have such a distinguished panel who are knowledgeable about the topic and are willing to share with us not only their professional but their personal views on it. Death and all that surrounds us is a topic that can cause many people distress and pain, but one that is very important to discuss. And I think that you will agree with me that it's a topic that we are very reluctant to discuss, and if we do it, we do it with some discomfort in Ireland. So as a nation, I think it's a very good day to open up that discussion in general. By pre-planning around issues that may affect us all, we can ensure that our wishes are met, decisions are made that our families and loved ones are reassured by, and that we are making choices which align with our own. These decisions affect so many areas, the type of care we want, spiritual needs, where and how we wish to be laid to rest, and so much more. So we hope this event opens the discussions, and we hope that it leads to many more. And I'll now ask our moderator, Mary Wilson, who I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, to lead on the discussion. I'm sure her voice will be known to you from her drive time show. So I feel like I'm in my car for a while here, <laughs> um, but I'm sure I'll open up to the visuals as we go. So enjoy the session. Thank you. Audrey, thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. And you're very welcome to what I hope today won't be a lecture won't be a conference as such, but rather, as Audrey said there, a conversation about living and about dying. And I know when I was asked to, to moderate this conversation that we're having today, I think even in the conversation with Jan when we talked about it, I started to lower my voice and speak in, you know, those hushed tones that, that we tend to adopt around death and dying and the bereaved. But Let's not make today about hushed tones, you know. Let's not make it about uh, being quiet and secret. Or, first, or, or, you know that thing we say in Ireland, no, no, we won't talk about that now. Uh, let's talk about things today um, openly, honestly. I'm sure some of what we say will be very sad. Um, some will spark memories for me, for all of you. Um, and some of it will be funny as well. Um, we've all lost loved ones or we're in the process of losing loved ones um, and we're all going to face this ourselves someday. Um, from my own perspective, because I'm going to ask each of the panellists, you know, why are you here? Uh, so I might tell you maybe my own little bit of, of, of background to this. And I'm very lucky. Um, I'm lucky that those close to me who have died, died after living very full lives. They died in their own beds, in their own homes, my mother and father particularly. But they managed to do that because they were very lucky to have hospice home care, uh, which came to them from the South Tipperary hospice movement. It made it possible for them to stay home and it made it possible for, for me and for my siblings to not be afraid of that process. So that's where I come from. Um, in introducing all of the panellists today, um, I think it is far more relevant that they tell you who they are why they're here, what they bring to this conversation, than for me to tell you that. So I'm just going to introduce each one of them and then come back to them and ask them to give a very small introduction. And then we'll break down this conversation into various parts about living, living with dying, dying, and what happens afterwards for those left behind. So on my immediate left, we have Dr. Joan Cunningham, the medical director here at Our Lady's Hospice and Care Services. Beside her, Alison O'Connor, broadcast and print journalist, columnist with the Irish Examiner, and indeed a, a regular on our own programme on Drive Time. Beside Alison, we have Robert Maguire. He's the general manager of Massey Brothers, the funeral directors. 
Then beside Robert, we have Dr. Ursula Bates. She's the principal clinical psychologist here at Our Lady's Hospice. And at the end, we have Orla Carmody, who's an author, broadcaster, and indeed a former director of the RTE board. So that's our panel this morning. They're all very welcome, and thank you all for coming along. Um, before we break it down, let's, let's go immediately to those short introductions, and I'll ask Joan to kick us off. Who are you? Why are you here? What okay. brought you here? <laughs> okay, so how do I put that in a, in a few words? It's um, 21 years ago since I graduated as a doctor, and my first job was working in a care of the elderly in it. And I loved that work, um, but that was my first real exposure to a palliative care team because they would come and see our patients who were very unwell or very symptomatic that we couldn't control their symptoms. And I think it was just that um, opportunity of seeing real teamwork in, in, in motion and seeing a difference what the palliative care team could do to individual patients and, and often I felt embarrassed when they would come back and find a little bit of information about my patients that I hadn't realised that were actually really crucial to their care. And so to cut a long story short, I came here in 2002 for an, initially for a year um, to see whether I, I liked palliative medicine with the plan of going back to Belfast and I'm still here. And I finished my training back in 2007 and initially came here as a locum doctor with Dr. Gregan for three months, as it was thought to be at that stage, and um, was lucky enough to get a, a permanent post and have been in position now for, for 10 years, primarily based in our satellite unit in Black Rock Hospice, which has 12 beds and a large community team with day hospice and outpatients and our specialist team visiting people in their own homes, but also with a commitment to the Wicklow Community Palliative Care Team and a sessional commitment to it's in Column Kills in Lachlanstein. Joan, thank you very much. Um, we will come back to you and maybe explore what keeps you here okay. uh, along the way. Okay. Uh, Alison, uh, you're a journalist. What, what brings you here today? Well, I guess my connection is that I'm a neighbour of the hospice. Um, it's part of my neighbourhood. My children go to school just across the road. Um, it might sound a bit odd, but I'm quite glad that there's a hospice in my, my neighbourhood. Um, I suppose I, um, both journalistically and personally, I'm interested in death. I uh, experienced it at quite a young age. My mother died when I was just 11, having been uh, ill for a number of years. And, um, and we could get into it later, uh, particularly in more recent years, a sort of a whole cascade of, of, of deaths. Um, and uh, I suppose it's, um, it intrigues me how... Um, even though you touched on it, Mary, how people are not willing to, to discuss the subject. As my husband said this morning, uh, I was telling him about, about this, and he was quoting his dentist. He quotes him a lot. I'm really not they're very close. <laughs> he said, as his dentist says, there's none of us getting out of here alive. You know, and yet it's a subject that we, that we you know, wholeheartedly really um, avoid. So, um, and it's not just, I should say, it's not just the, the hospice. I've been here and I've written about it. We also have the crematorium just up the road and I've also done a tour of that and we have a festival here in Harold's Cross every year and they open it up and I guess and people think I'm kind of odd for that actually. <laughs> we might so. explore the, the yeah. oddness a little bit yeah. more Alison as well. Now Robert um, we could say because you're the general manager of Massey Brothers that you're in the business of death but it, we, we were talking on the way in you're in the business of life as well just tell us a little bit about what daily life is like for you and, and why you're here today. I suppose I'm, I'm third generation in uh, my family business, which is Massey Brothers. And uh, again, it was set up by my grandmother, Sissy, um, back in the late 1920s. And again, through the care that she gave in her community, that's what, how the business evolved. And again, every day just enables us to be able to honour the life that's come through our door on that day. And again, every funeral is so different. We're all so different as people on a day-to-day -day that funerals are no different than that and they can be just from any scale. And again, we just like to gather as much information as possible about that deceased person so that we can honour their life by maybe shining of their personality through that funeral, whether that be through a team or maybe even just a, a colour. But 
really bringing that person into the funeral process, which I just think is, is hugely important, you know. And uh, again, I'm here to offer whatever insight I can into the ever-changing industry that is the funeral business. It, uh, the last five years in itself has, has seen huge changes. And again, any insight I can offer, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that. All right. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Ursula, you're the principal clinical psychologist here. Tell us a little bit more about um, being here and I suppose your own personal experiences. Right. Well, I kind of came here at the end of my career in many ways because I'd worked in learning disability. I'd worked in the States for 10 years came back to Ireland, worked in St. Vincent's in psycho-oncology, and then had an opportunity, really, to move into the hospice system. But for me, it's kind of a coming home, because I grew up in the west of Ireland, and I grew up in a funeral parlour. So from <laughs> I was very tiny, from we were six or seven, my brother and myself were taught how to open the door. So we had to open the door and say, hello, how are you? I'm sorry for your trouble. <laughs> Who would you like to talk to? My mother and my father, right? And my mother ran the kitchen, so the kitchen was cups of coffee and tears and talks about how he died, God bless him. You know, so we heard the whole story in the kitchen. And then my father did the business and to the front of the house, it was an old Victorian house. In the front, we kept the coffins and the shrouds. And my brother and I used to play there. He was always the priest, and I was always the dead person. So that was the beginning of my life. So what it does, though, in the west of Ireland is it's a village and it's a community. So you see the process from beginning to end, and it was always contained. It was always with family, with neighbours, with community. So when I go to Black Rock in particular, I walk in past where we keep the bodies, up the stairs to work. It's like going home for me, it really is. <laughs> uh, I might come back to you and to you as well, Robert, about that fear of death, because I think being around death, mm. does it remove that fear, I wonder? Something we'll, we'll think about. Orla, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're here. Orla Carmody. Well, before I start, I'm just laughing at Mary's uh, description there because we waked my husband's mother, Gran, 91 years of, of age during the summer for three days in our house so all the West of Ireland relatives could come and it was just like that. So I'm just thinking of it and it was a wonderful celebration of her life. I came here first 30 years ago, a long avenue, a long avenue up to the old building and none of the fabulous buildings that are here now. My young husband at the time was a patient. I'm going to be the first one to do the, the wobble, sorry. <laughs> but, but that was bound to happen, wasn't it? Um, but, you know, my life went on. I'd, I, I've, I've had a, a, you know, things have been wonderful. I've had a great career and I, I have a wonderful husband and four kids and, and life has been marvellous. But I suppose I reconnected with the hospice recently because that time that I spent there at a very young age, you know, I was so young, I was in my 20s. When I look back at it now, I was only a baba going through that. But... Um, it just it really stayed with me and has stayed with me all my life. The care we, we, I had here and the whole experience of hospice. So I reconnected this year with uh, Jan and I wanted to uh, do something for the hospice and give something back. So I've come up with this book called Without You and it's experience of loss, living with loss. And I've asked all kinds of people, the great and the good, to write a letter to their loved one who is gone. And some people amazingly get that straight away and other people don't. Some of the people who got it most quickly were politicians and we give our politicians such a slagging. But right across the board, right across the political spectrum, a few of them that I asked, they said straight away, absolutely, I get that. If it helps one person, I'll do it. And they were brilliant about meeting the deadline ping into my inbox came the letter so I was so impressed but there are also broadcasters musicians a lot of people in the public eye and people who are not uh, necessarily known but maybe were thrust into the public eye in the circumstances of losing somebody so the book will be out in the spring and I'm going to pass around the two covers that we've come up with for it um, a lovely young designer Alan Hatton who Jan is a colleague of Jan's came up with two beautiful designs and at the end I'm going to ask Mary if she doesn't mind to ask you to vote on which one you'd like if that's OK, so we'll pass them around and you can tell me what you think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orla. Um, as I said at the beginning, we're going to break down the various questions around living, dying, the aftermath, dealing with death and so on. Let me start with a question. And just a quick show of hands. How many people here have made a will? That's pretty good. How many people here have a living will? That's not bad. It's less than a third, I'd say. Um, so that leads us to that question about how we 
think about death, perhaps Joan uh, and Ursula particularly here, while we're still healthy, in the whole of our health, say, is it something you find people ever talk to you about or think about? Joan, to you first. I'm scanning the audience and I was thinking, gosh, if my solicitor is here, he's going to be really interested in this. <laughs> because he keeps asking me, we've just bought a house, and he keeps telling me, you need to write your will. And I, I can see a few colleagues haven't either, so I feel a little bit reassured. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just ask the panel, have you all made wills? Yes. yes. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm active in it. I did, I did uh, have a conversation with my should, husband about it last week. I should but have asked the panel as well. I have made one, actually. Um, sorry, Joan. So, but, so, so yeah. I think that's fascinating because it's one of the things we talk to patients about. Mm. And yet I seem to have the same struggles mm. that mm. many of them have. Mm. Because I sometimes think, well, how can you be living with an, an advanced illness um, in my head and not have considered writing a, a will? And yet here I am, and I know it's really important to do, mm -hmm. and yet for some reason I'm procrastinating. Um, so if anything happens to this, I promise I will make my <laughs> will. Um, We've created business for the lawyers so, here so, today. So I, th I think it, it, sometimes it, it's that fa facing up to it and, and acknowledging mm. what, what's happening. And, and that can be a struggle for all of mm. us. Um, mm. And sometimes when you're seriously unwell and ill, there are so many other competing interests. Yeah. Um, not only if you're undergoing your treatment and you have hospital appointments, but also that life within the family goes on mm. outside mm. of that. And there's mm. still all the demands on family life and trying to make those commitments. And sometimes things that seem very obviously important just get, get lowered down, down the priority list. Um, Ursula, in, in keeping the conversation about wills, uh, I don't know if you come across the living will in the course of, of, of your daily work, or perhaps talk to us about why a living will is important. Well, well, living wills express your wishes and your preferences, and that's why they're important. But, but to come back a step from it, Mary, I mean, there is such a thing as denial of death. I mean, Ernst Becker wrote a very famous book on the denial of death, and he says that all culture, everything we do, is an effort to deny the fact that we die. So, so every poem we write, every piece of music, every building we build. So the one thing not to underestimate is the denial of death, you know, that... The notion of, we, we can talk about maybe it would be a good idea to write an advanced care plan, but as Joan says, put me in a doctor's office with a major diagnosis, I, I might not want to go there, you know, so it's quite a, it's quite a sensitive area, mm -hmm. it really is. How do you encourage people to it, or is that something you do? Well, well we would certainly um, talk to people about, you know, maintaining their voice. That's, I, I think that's the way we'd often talk to people, saying it's very important that your voice is heard, that your voice is supported. How can I support you talking about things that are difficult? Mm -hmm. And I think everyone in the audience who works clinically would, would be committed to opening up that conversation. All we can do is invite people, mm -hmm. you know, to create the conditions that invite them to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And some people will step into it and some people won't. Mm -hmm. and, and we would never put somebody under pressure. But I think we'd all ask ourselves, in our practice, have we created the kind of space where somebody could actually say, you know, I've been thinking about, because the difficulty for family members is they'll often say, oh no, mommy, don't think about that today, let's go and have a coffee, yes. whereas we just will sit in the space and see what comes next. Mm. Alison, do you have thoughts on it, uh, yeah, seeing I do, as I do. you I, have I feel, no will? Yeah, I feel, <laughs> I have addressed it with the solicitor, Mary, <laughs> not my <laughs> I'm sort of intrigued by by this notion, or saddened actually, that people who would want to speak about it, maybe outside of, I know that that's something that the hospice is really, really good at. But I'd like to talk for a minute about a friend of, a very good friend of mine who died during the summer. And he was diagnosed with very aggressive leukemia a year ago, had a bone marrow transplant, um, and he died in July. And it was actually while we were on our holidays in West Cork, where, where I'm from. And in a way, I was sort of saying, oh, my God, because we had just been through a number of years of just, like I said, my mum died when I was, was small, but she had a very big family, and they all lived to be as old as brushes, but then just kind of like dominoes, you know. I mean, and uh, I was, even for my kids, you know, and I was thinking, oh, my God, not another, because last year my father-in-law was dying. He died actually in October during our holidays. And an uncle of mine... I was up and down to Cork. He died a day shy of his 99th birthday. So I thought, God. But anyway, do you know what? It was an absolute privilege 
to have been there in looking back on it that we were there that we could see him Pat was just amazing he was amazing throughout his illness but how open he was about death um, he and he had what he said himself really in the final few weeks a living funeral there's a restaurant in Bantry just outside the town that he and his his partner my friend as well loved and in the final two weeks before he died they would gather there he'd have his oxygen tank beside him family friends and he would speak about it and he would say things. He was a really bright guy and I still can see him. And he was talking about the, how Carbonara came to exist. <laughs> and he said at the end, I'm entitled to be boring because I'm not going to be around for much longer. <laughs> and I said, Pat, you're going to have to try harder. That was kind of pretty fascinating. And there was a really, like when he was in the hospital, a pretty well-known sports coach, I won't say who, who knew him, who came to see him. He hadn't been to, they hadn't seen each other for a couple of years. And I remember Pat trying to think of the exact words. The guy has since gone from his job, but as he walked in, Pat said to him, um, the rich guy, he said, you and I have something in common. Neither of us are long for our current role. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so amazing to be a part of that and, for mm. him, and to see, particularly for his family and for his partner, and even to see now, I mean, obviously she is suffering so acutely and misses him so much, but that their conversations and what would happen afterwards. Mm. And his funeral was amazing. Um, one of the reasons I'm really glad I'm a Kulshi is um, that it's very uh, common sort of wakes at home. Mm. And I've even heard my children who are 10 and seven last year having a discussion because they'd been to so many and a number of the merits of a funeral home over a wake at home. Mm. <laughs> and I saw them with aunts and uncles of mine who were in their bed, particularly aunt and uncle who died within six weeks of each other. And the grandkids and my kids sitting at the end of the bed and them lying there. And it's so much more kind of normalized. Their granddad died last year. Mm. Similar thing at home in the coffin. L just yesterday evening, I was at a funeral of a man who died here mm -hmm. on, um, on Monday. And th his family speaking about how amazing it was to have been in the hospice for the last few days. And he was waked at home. Um, so Pat's funeral, Pat was at home and he was in the most fabulous bright yellow top because that was his favourite top and his favourite colour. And his partner's nieces and nephews were around and it was a real celebration of his, mm. of his life and the funeral was the same. But I think as has been touched on by Ursula, who knows how any of us would react. You would like to think that that's how you'd be, but you've no way of knowing. And what about Orla? And you did experience death at, at such a young age. But I, I know as I get older, I think about it more. And I, and, and I think as I go to funerals now, uh, I think when I was younger, when I went to weddings, I thought, oh, that'd be a nice wedding. I'd like to do that at my wedding. <laughs> um, yeah, that music was really good. I have to say, as I go to funerals now, I see things at funerals that I think I'd like to incorporate into my own funeral yeah. when the time yeah. comes. That, that's a very good point you make because um, my husband and his family, his brothers, Gavin, um, they wrote on the, on the mass booklet, they wrote a whole kind of a life story of their mother. Mm. And everybody said afterwards, oh my God, that was amazing. Because you know your colleagues and friends and people come to an elderly parent's funeral out of respect, but they wouldn't necessarily know her. But everybody took it away and they said, I'm putting that away now for when my time comes. And obviously mm. they were thinking of maybe mm. their own parents mm. or whatever. It was a nice thing to do to get a real sense of the person um, and the other thing I thought that was that, that because that's the most recent one in our family that that comes to mind um, Gran was very specific about what her arrangements would be down to the, the, the sort of the funeral mass and how it was all to be attended to and what music was to be picked she was mad about Pavarotti all her life so she had all her Pavarotti pieces picked out and she wanted a big portrait of Pavarotti <laughs> the main man up <laughs> in the church as well and it was one of the offertory things brought up and the other thing that she loved in her life was her Chardonnay so we had a bottle of Chardonnay went up as well with her so like that was lovely and that's the point you make Robert about re reflecting the person's own um, life and their experience but the interesting thing that came out of that was my own mother who's 87 um, after Grand's funeral had a coffee morning invited around all her girls the dolls as I call them and she said right we're all going to make our arrangements because it helps the family because they could mm -hmm. see because Grand had been so specific about what she wanted it took a load off everybody else at a very difficult time. So my mum and the dolls, they all sat around and they did all their arrangements and they've it all written out so it'll make things easier for their families, which is lovely and it's very considerate. 
just that point of though the conversation and how you bring up the conversation with people and as you said Mary everybody is different and some people can tackle this in a way that other others can't and you know at, at a very young age as I said my husband at the time Kieran was was only 30 31 so it was a very very difficult time but one of the things that I remember that struck me at the time in the hospice was that whole point of the care of the family as well as the care of the person and you know you know, people would kind of say, do you want to have a conversation? It was, it's, it's not that people don't want to have the conversation. Sometimes they do, but that nobody gives them the opportunity to have mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and to say, look, do you want to talk about this? And I think, you know, for those of us who tiptoe around it, I think I'm a bit like you, Alison. I have this fascination with the death and I'm comfortable with it because I've, I've dealt with it from such a young age. So, you know, when somebody belonging to me or somebody I know is unwell or they're facing into something, I'll always say to them, tell me about it, how do you feel about it, what's going on for you, you know, just to give them the opportunity. If they don't want to talk, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've opened a door for them or given them that opportunity. That's something I've, I've learned yeah. to always to try and do. Robert, by the time a family comes to you, I suppose generally they're coming to you because a member of the family has died and they want you to plan the funeral arrangements. Or sometimes uh, does the individual come to you first? Would, would you come out here to the hospice, for well, example, that, that and happening. discuss arrangements with somebody who knows that they perhaps have a, a short time left? Yeah, and not only just a short time left, but there's a lot of people who like to be very organised. There's a yeah. lot of people who like to plan. There's a lot of people who might not have any family left to plan their own arrangements. And again, not only that, then there's the financial element of that. And some people don't want to burden people with funeral expenses or maybe they might not know exactly what that person wanted, you know. So we have found, in, especially in the last kind of five or ten years, the way the funeral process has changed so much. It's moving more so away from the traditional funeral. It's becoming very unique. It's There's civil celebrants. There's all different kinds of funerals nowadays. So Do you counsel people to... You know, if they come to you with maybe an enormously expensive plan or a, an enormously flamboyant or, let's call it, inappropriate plan, how do you counsel people in those situations? Well, again, it, it all really comes back to, I suppose, is it appropriate or not? You know, and again, you would do your very best to get to know the person you're sitting in front of and get to know you're going to meet some quirky people. You know, you're going to... I had one situation where they were adamant they wanted the song burn baby burn after the cremation and that that happened so again everyone is they're all unique and we're all so unique and again i can't exactly tell that person no when they're the ones making their own funeral arrangements. It's that question, what's appropriate? Exactly. <laughs> and again, if they feel it's appropriate, who am I to tell them mm. it's not? If mm. it's not following the traditional funeral in a church, you know, or in a religious building. So it's just, it's very different. And again, yes, in the last five years, we'd have an awful lot of people who maybe I, I've dealt with people in their 40s and their 50s who have no ailments and just want to be prepared and want to put their own beliefs down on paper and they might see that as a, a huge weight off their shoulders mm -hmm. and uh, we would uh, yeah it's I suppose that's why I love the job I do because no matter what every family I meet are so so different mm -hmm. and no one funeral is ever the same and, uh, well, let's talk some more about that question of how you open the door to the conversation how you if if I, I was thinking of something. My, my mother had, had cancer for 30 years uh, and lived quite healthily and successfully with cancer for that length of time. But she did it by a process of absolute denial. And she never, ever said she had cancer. And even when she was dying from cancer, she never said anything other than, is that old thing going to kill me? And we all really, I suppose, played into the denial. And what I'm wondering, Joan and Ursula, is how you open that door to, to those conversations with people, or, or should you, or when you do it. And I don't mean just for medical people, mm. medically trained people like yourselves, but for people like me sitting at home with my mother having a cup of tea, um, do I open the door or do I participate in the denial? I think when we're talking to families, we would often say, do what feels right within your own comfort zone because some family members will feel very at ease starting that conversation. 
so other people will immediately start to panic and get very stressed about it and that's certainly not what you want to do when you're starting these conversations. And I think when whatever aspect when you're under our services, we just try to get to know the patient and, and, and try and find out what they know about the, their current situation. What have the doctors told them? What have the nurses told them? And you very quickly realise how much they know or how much they suspect but don't actually want to name it. And we would certainly never force the truth on anyone, but that they have the opportunity to come back at any stage if they have, they have any questions. And what we're trying to do is work out what's important to them, what matters to them so that we can help shape it because you don't want to make somebody talk about their cancer if they don't yeah. want to talk about it. And there's nothing really to be gained from that. And I know, and I know we had this gentleman who's, who's died with us in the hospice in Black Rock several years ago. Um, but he was a single man living alone and came into the hospice on and off for about five, six years. So that was quite exceptional. That was quite a long journey with this. And I always got my medical students to talk to him because he was a fascinating man, had, had had a wonderful life, was really insightful. And I'd say over the course of those five years, he probably met between 30 and 40 medical students. And he never ever told them he had cancer. He had every other diagnosis but he never, so they would often come back and present. And I said, so, so what's his diagnosis? And he would never have discussed it with them. And that was just his way of coping. So he was very aware he was coming into the hospice. He was very aware of what we did. But for him, it was just too much to have that conversation. Uh, and that was okay. That was okay for him. Uh, and Ursula, do you have a, a situation or situations sometimes where... Um, family members realise they're reaching a point where they need hospice care. You know, either at home or in many cases here or in Black Rock in the centre. But they don't know how to broach that subject with their family member who's ill. Uh, I think that's quite a struggle, um, but it's often in a context, you know, so that mm. they'd also be perhaps in, still in the acute hospital setting, yeah. so they might be able to engage the palliative team there in that setting and there are palliative care teams in the main hospitals. Or the other thing is that GPs are very actively involved and know their patients very, very well. So often in a situation like that, it's, it's a situation where, you know, a conversation with a GP can be extremely helpful. I, I took my own mum when she was 89 after a very serious fall to visit her GP and my brother and myself went to the GP first and said, we think we're at a point where there's a turn on the road mm. and we'd be really, really grateful if you could begin a conversation with my mother. And the GP handled it so skillfully. I mean, she put the two of us out of the room. She invited my mum in. She invited her to begin to talk about what had happened and did she see things changing. And that GP was able to walk my mother through her future cares and, and into considering that she might need to be in a nursing home, which again is the same kind of... Mm turn on the road. So I do think it's a point where very, very important for families to, to pull in resources, you know, so they may need to talk to GPs, nurses, other people mm. to facilitate that conversation. Is it something that hospice can do, that they can come in at that point to, to help that conversation? Well, we may well be already involved at a community level, Yeah. you know, or yeah. we're very open to consultations, you know, we're very open to people calling us as a team to look for that kind yeah. of advice, you know. But uh, we want to know the people quite well, though, as well, wouldn't we, John? We'd want yeah. to Yeah, know because, them. you know, we're all part, we're all members of families. We all have loved ones. And uh, thankfully, you know, I haven't had to have that conversation. It, it happened kind of organically in the case of my parents, really, that the, the hospice care team kind of arrived through the GP, actually, as you say. But I think I would, I, I don't know about you all, uh, or, you know, uh, Robert or Alison, would you find it very difficult to have that conversation? I think um, the starting point of the conversation is, is very hard. And in my own experience, um, again, because as I said, Kieran was so young at the time and up to that point had been going in and out of St. Vincent's Hospital and places like mm. that. And then it came to the point where the hospice conversation had to be had. And, you know, it was very, very tough for a young person. And I remember again, a GP, our GP, who had been so good at the time and working with us and <coughs> saying, we're going to frame this conversation around where you're going to get the best care from this point on. 
And at that stage, we lived um, in Bray and here's the hospice and the home care team didn't go that far and there was no option for a home care situation, which again is much more evolved now. So it, def it had to be residential care. So it had to be framed in a way that this is the best place, that's the place you're going to get the care you need at this point. But I just, again, remember just being awestruck by the skill of the GP who helped me have that conversation with him and made it happen. And, and the transition then became quite easy. And, you know, I, I even remember, as I said, coming down that avenue in the ambulance the first day and, you know, just the welcome we got here. It, you just felt embraced. You felt, OK, this is going to work. D describe that to me some more, because... I suppose no matter how much I read and inform myself, you can still feel if I go to the hospice, I'm not coming out. Yeah, and, and obviously, again, there's, there's levels of knowing and levels of, of understanding. And, um, you know, in Kieran's case, at that point, he had become quite incapacitated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, I wasn't sure how much he was understanding and how much he wasn't understanding, but we were framing everything in a way. And um, as I said, what, what struck us most, I remember arriving, was the care and the embrace and the, you know, we're going to find a really special room for you guys. You guys need a really nice room, you know, and little things like that that just made you feel you were going to be wrapped mm. up in cotton wool. Mm. And, and that made it possible, mm. certainly for me. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, the facilities were nothing like they were today. So when I say a special room, it's not we're talking the Ritz. It was simply just we're going to make it special. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, and that was lovely. And, and so that that is, to my mind, the memory for me of mm. that that care. Yeah. What is it like here? You work here, Joan and Ursula. You, you wrote a column about it. Yeah, I did. What I, were your impressions? I wrote a feature on it, actually, it's, which is not something I do a lot of nowadays. Um, but... Uh, I had been here before, I had a, a, an uncle who died a number of years ago, and it's funny you're talking about the, the death conversation. I went around on rounds, I went to the meeting beforehand where you have the discussion, which I was struck by how sort of, it's the discussion about patients from every, it is, it almost sounds cliched, but so holistic. Um, and I went around on the rounds and that felt, it really felt, you know, a privilege to do that. But there was one particular man, I can still remember him, and he you could see he wanted to have I've you know I thought okay this man wants to talk about about dying and um the 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 doctor who, who was wonderful she had the conversation with them again sort of what you mentioned well what have you been told by other doctors what now halfway through this chat I wanted to say yes you're dying yes you know because I felt that's not I don't mean that that sounds like I was being callous but I, I kind of felt this is what he wants and we'll but it, it was kind it's the of journalist in the you. journalist in me. I Answer think, yeah. the question. And now, now, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he, it ended up being um, there was kind of in and out and around it. And, and at the end, it wasn't uh, the doctor didn't say you're dying. And we had a chat afterwards in the corridor and we talked it through. And I realized completely very experienced doctor. Mm. She was fantastic. This was the first of a, what was obviously going to be a number of conversations that this man was, was going to have. He had decided, but he wasn't ready yet mm. to have that conversation. And I guess you, you just, like I said this earlier, you have no idea how you're going to react yourself in that conversation. And one of the things I think is an awful pity about how people have this kind of... Um, an uncle of mine that died two years ago and they, he was very sick and the family were like, we are not bringing him to the hospice. You know, that way he'll know he's dying. <laughs> and I was kind of intrigued by this and I thought, yeah, but I mean, that gives an up Anyway, but, mm. that, you know, each, each, each to their own situation. But an, an, an aunt of mine who was going in for a fairly high-risk heart procedure a year and a half ago and we were driving up to the Beacon and... I thought we would we'll have that. We had spoken in and around it, right down to what would she want to, to you know, what would she want to be laid out in and all of that. And I, I'm glad to say we even had a bit of a laugh in the middle of it mm. all. Yeah, she's a very controlling sister, and I said she's going to want to put you in the that outfit and we'll, you know. <laughs> and it was I, 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 I personally would have felt so remiss if I if I hadn't. And it brings that brings on to another thing where she was going in for this procedure that she was 82. Um, that I really felt that if it hadn't been offered, she wouldn't necessarily have wanted to go for it. It presented a real dilemma for her 
did she want this? It was high risk, but it was going to, to lengthen her life. Um, and I think that's, there's a book, there's a guy in, in the Cork University Hospital gastroenterologist called Seamus Omani, if I'm getting his name right, wrote a really interesting book about two years ago called The Way We Die Now. Mm. Um, now he's a bit, it's very, and he's talking about how death has become so medicalized mm. and how people are not willing to accept that elderly relatives and that, that even like they're looking for people who are close to 90 or 100 saying, you know, well, I want her in intensive care. I want every resource used because there's a, a lack of acceptance that people get to a certain age and that they, mm. they die. Now, the guy who wrote the book is quite kind of arsy, actually. It's a big interesting guy to work with, this personality. And he's not even that complimentary about the palliative care movement. He's sort of saying that they're, they're taking over death and trying to make it very sort of specialised in their area. He's saying it's so awful to die in an acute hospital. And I think he's, he's right about that, but I would disagree with them on, mm. on, on the work done by the palliative care movement. But it's... I'm after losing my, tra my train of Don't thought. Don't worry, because I, yeah. I, I, we, we've been talking about bringing well, I was just here. going to conclude. Yeah, go my aunt had that procedure. She was very sick for about six months afterwards. And I thought, Jesus, you know, I don't know about this life. But actually, she's fabulous now. She moved into a nursing home a couple of months ago. And I say, so you just never know she's what. still living her yeah. life. Yeah. As I say, we, to, to bring us in here to what daily life is like here, we've talked a lot about older people dying. I want to talk maybe about younger people dying, the people, you know, who haven't had the three score and ten, as they used to say. But uh, what is daily life like here in the hospice uh, for perhaps younger people living with cancer, living with serious illness? I, I saw um, a man earlier uh, in his wheelchair going down the path with his dog tied on to the, 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 the wheelchair. I'm presuming he's, he's living here at the moment, but he was out and about. So just give us a sense of the, the, the daily life. I know it differs for everyone, Joan. Joan and I were actually chatting about that um, when we were preparing for this. We were saying we all remember, and the audience remember, one young man. And I, when I work in the mornings, I try to get people at about 11 o'clock. So you see me scurrying down the corridors, trying to nail mm. people down. But to get into this young man's room, if you tried it at 11 o'clock in the morning, it was blacked out. You climbed over two of his mates who were sleeping on the floor. A lot of cans in various places. <laughs> you hope to God the girlfriend wasn't in the bed as well because you'd have to work, deal with that. And you'd say to him, I'm the side, can I come and talk to him? No, no, no. <laughs> so, I, I mean, what I mean by that is we completely provide whatever environment they want. And in his case, it was a young male environment and it smelled like a young male environment. <laughs> You know, so, so there, I mean, we're very conscious of the fact that young people are very precious. Mm. Um, it is a slightly odd environment for mm. the, them to be in. And I know everyone from the people who make the meals to the care staff are willing to go 110% for younger people. Mm. We let them out to electric picnic. So you've been, you've been part of that. A 17-year-old um, girl with us um, many years ago who went to electric picnic. And we hemmed and had, and it was just so important to her that she went. And then the next morning there was an announcement that somebody had died at an electric picnic. And our hearts stopped, but it wasn't her. <laughs> somebody had taken a drug overdose, and she came back, and she was extremely unwell, but full of life, that she'd been able to do this. And I think what we try to do for both our young patients and our older patients is see what matters to them, and where possible, frame their care around their needs. So if they want to lie in to 11 or 12 o'clock, we try and facilitate that. If they want to stay up late watching Netflix, we try and facilitate that. And I think you asked a question a few questions ago about what's different about the hospice. For me, it's that collective sense of purpose within the team, that we're all striving together to reach the goals for our patients in whatever way that is. So if it is that their physical symptoms are the priority, then we're, we're working on the medications. If it's more the, the spiritual or the psychological distress, well, we can do a little bit of that, but sometimes we defer to our chaplains and our, our psychology um, team. And so it's, for me, that's, that's the real mm. value. And I know there are multidisciplinary teams in acute hospitals, <laughs> And we all work differently, but I think we all recognise that this is such a precious time in individuals' lives and their families. Mm. And by families, that's anyone who's important to them. So it could be their partner, it could be their children, it could be their cousin three times removed or their next door neighbour. Mm. And finding out what matters to them and where possible, 
trying to, to, to do what they need us to do. I'm always fascinated um, how you mediate family difficulties and we all know we're all members of families families are not perfect families are not always cohesive families are not always in agreement and do you have to mediate all of that it's a brief point following on from that one of the questions i had when i was going around was this issue of people dying particularly from cancer and of pain and you know you have the sense that at least you know, that somebody going to a hospice, that that is the best place for their pain to be controlled. And having a discussion around that, and it was very interesting to hear that um, oftentimes those, very, those family things that you talk about and where, you know, I suppose at a time of stress like that, often a family can actually, many families will pull together, but many, as we know, can fall apart. And that being told of patients who, when, when things were going on like that, and particularly the stress was acute around family, that it's then that patients who might agree or disagree would have said, my pain is very bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, it, you know, there would be that, that, that sense and that everything then is connected. And that really shows the importance of how, you know, that the team approach of, mm -hmm. for, for all aspects of the, mm -hmm. the psychological and the physical. Mm -hmm. I think one of the aspects for families in this scenario is um, wanting to know what's going on, wanting to know what the care plan is, wanting to know what the medication is. And I know when I was at that stage as a very young woman, I was a little Rottweiler and I wanted to be across everything and know absolutely everything and every milligram of every medication he was given. I was just managing this mm. with the same attention to detail I give now to my business and my family and all of those things. But I remember that whole thing around um, at what point do you start using morphine? At what point does the, and this is the purpose of palliative care and, you know, is it right and is it the correct point? And I, and I think that's something... Um, hospice, hospital, whatever, I think you have to be very open with families. I think particularly where there is a primary carer or the, the, the primary, the next of kin, I, I do think it, there, there is a need for a huge openness around it. And because I think families who are, are, are entering into this fray for the first time are a little bit doubtful about what is the plan here and are they going to be slipping mum something that I don't know about? And it's, it's just a natural su suspicion that people have. Mm. And where is it? the correct decision to ease somebody and where is it maybe too soon according to the family. So I think that dialogue between mm. the care, the professionals and the families has to be wide open and I think it has to be very frank. Where does that dialogue take place, Ursula? Was that with you, um, or with Joan, with both of you? Well, it's very continuous. It's very, mm. it's very seamless. And I mean, I would say we have to bear in mind the whole hospice team are trained in communication. You know what I mean? So that the nurses, the care assistants, even the kitchen staff, we'd have opportunities during the year to sit down and talk about how to communicate, right? And what does communication mean to people? We have a very strong social work team that are very skilled. So in our case, say in Black Rock, it would be um, you know, predominantly the social worker who would build a relationship um, with particular family members. And then on the back of her assessment, we'd know when do we need to have family meetings. Um, and then I might be involved with specific family members. But, but the holding of that is, comes from the social work team because families are, are little systems onto themselves. They're little worlds. Mm -hmm. And they function in certain ways. And what is normal for one family, what's a balance for one family, is very different for another family. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to get a good f feel for how does that family keep itself steady. Do you have to resolve mm -hmm. conflicts? To say that again? Do you have to resolve conflicts? Yes, we do. We do. We do. Do you sometimes have to say, you can't see your loved one now? Well, we they don't want to see you, we you're say creating it, too much conflict for we them. We wouldn't quite say it that way. <laughs> uh, we might suggest that I'm going to uh, you know, a roster needs to be organised. You know, maybe yeah. we have a... Because we'd really, we really value um, continuity and contact, so we'd go out of our way to make it possible mm. for somebody to be with somebody. Mm. So unless a patient specifically requested that somebody wouldn't be there. We'd honour a patient's wishes, but we'd have a conversation before we'd actually ban someone. You know? In these days of the, the blended family, the, the bigger families, the maybe ex-wife or ex-wives or ex-husbands and children from two or three relationships and the conflicts that are there, how, how do you, because I presume these are things you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. What do you do? try to make the best of a difficult situation yeah. and sometimes 
when we're rounding and seeing patients uh, and the nurses and the team are delivering care, there might be a family member present with the patient. And so with the patient's permission, you're giving them updates as to how the patient is. But sometimes it come, becomes very apparent that that information is not being fed through to other family members or that other family members are, are coming in reporting a different story. And that would be the situation where we would probably organise a family meeting through the medical social worker. And depending on what the agenda is for the family meeting, what members of the um, multidisciplinary team need to be present. I think we have to be very mindful as a team though that we're not family therapists. And so we can't change long-standing issues within the family or conflict that is just beyond maybe our skills. But what we try and do is really focus that we're here for the patient. We're here at this time, at this moment, to do what is right for the patient, whatever that is. Sometimes we've had family meetings and members have left, stormed out of the room. Some people become very emotional. And then I think we, we try and contain it as best as possible. Wherever possible, we look for one person because there's so many patients in the family, all the team can't be updating different members of the family. And sometimes that works. Sometimes, as Ursula says, we'll get uh, advise them to, to have a road and, and, and sometimes the differences are so ingrained. I know certainly we've had a situation where a family member has come into the hospice, seen that another family member's car is in the car park and has driven away mm. to come back half an hour later when they're not in, in, in the room. And what they said was, well, actually, it's better if we don't actually see each other. Mm. But also we've had the situation where patients have, have declined to see relatives and just said no. And then that's quite challenging as well, mm. especially when patients have had arguments or different differences in opinions that have become you know, ingrained mm. and long-standing and, and somebody wants to make amends. And, and I know of one gentleman where that happened and that was just heartbreaking mm. because the patient didn't want to make amends, but the brother did. And so that's when our, our medical social worker became more involved with that family member to try and support him. So you see very difficult situations. And again, going back to just trying to do our best for that family and that patient at, in that I moment. I presume this is not the norm, but it happens. It happens. Yeah. Does it? It happens a lot. Does yeah. it really? Because, because you've got to remember, we, the people we have in the hospice often have exceptional needs. Mm -hmm. So they're very different to people that will be in a community setting. Okay. So they're, they may be more vulnerable or have more struggles. But the other thing we do is we have values that we work from in the hospice system. And I'm a little bit older. So sometimes I say, well, here now we value certain things. And therefore, I want you to think about when you look back in your life and you look at this moment in time, how would you like to have acted? So how can you be your better self? So sometimes you can invite people to, you know, mm. take a slightly different mm. position as well. Mm. Because we very much value compassion and justice and, you know, we have all the values of the system that we carry with us and we try to bring that as well, you know. I want to move on to the section of death itself, but I think it might be important just before we move on to death and how we deal with that, and I think you're going to be very central to this, Robert, now, how we deal with this, to talk about something you raised, Orla, pain, pain management. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, I, I suppose, when my parents were ill, my, my mother particularly in her last couple of weeks with hospice care, I just wanted to know that she was given whatever she needed to make sure she didn't have pain. It wasn't a priority with me that she was compass mentis or that she could still talk to me. It was very important to me that she be pain free. That, and that was where I came from. But I, I don't know how other people deal with that or how you deal with that, Joan. I, I think there's a, a spectrum of opinions. So there are very much the family members who want everything to be done to even that they'd say, you know, if you have to make them personal unconscious to get them pain free, do it. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have the other end of the spectrum where people are very apprehensive about the use of medications. And I think, Orly, you mentioned it there about mm -hmm. the, the fear of morphine and um, opioids and I think that's understandable because opioids get such a bad press uh, in many ways because they are incredibly dangerous drugs in the wrong hands but we are experts in what we do so just the way you go to a cardiologist to get your heart sorted you come to palliative care to look after your complex symptoms 
And we're certainly not in the business of giving medication just to make them sleepy or groggy. For us to do a good job, we talk about maximise the patient's quality of life, and whatever that means to them. But for us, it's often that they can do the things that they want to, that they're alert and interactive with their family and their friends. And so when we're having that conversation about, well, is this a pain that might respond to opioids? Or is this a pain that one of the other painkillers will, um, will work equally as well? But likewise, all medication has side effects, and it's our responsibility when we're recommending a drug that we assess the effects of it. Is it helping with pain relief, but also are there any side effects that are intolerable or actually contraindicating the use of that drug or, or, or increasing it further? And so we don't make any light decisions when we're adjusting medication or adding medication. Likewise, there is a cohort of patients who believe that pain must be experienced and offered up um, and that can be from a religious point of view and then that's a real struggle for family members or for us as a team because we know there's a pain relief medication that we could easily give but again it's coming back to the patient and respecting their wishes but also letting them know that if they change their mind or if they think it gets too bad that there's something that we can try and again reassure them we're constantly monitoring for side effects. Do you want to add to that, Ursula? I, I think it, it always makes me think of the mind-body relationship, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that there, you know, before I worked in hospice, I would have had a slightly naive idea about pain. I would have kind of thought, well, you know, if you did enough yoga or you meditated and you did your mindfulness, mm -hmm. you'd somehow be able to move yourself, disconnect from your body in some way. But I think the, the subjectivity of pain, what the lived experience of pain is, a is unique for every person and B needs to be taken really seriously because when people suffer severe pain they get extremely anxious, they anticipate the next pain so it has a huge impact on the quality of their day. So I think I've learned humility in this job and just learned to be you know, cautious about the role of psychology and cautious about you know, that notion that mind can overcome matter, you know, that you can mm. overcome your body. Mm. So it's taught me a lot. Having gone up in a a small town um, and uh, you know we talk about or somebody I mean you've all probably be familiar with this somewhat awful phrase of well you know he died roaring oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that <laughs> and that relates to whatever pain was experienced at the time and I think that there is maybe one of the issues for the hospice movement is this idea of the pump the drugs this kind of mystique around it now I personally I think on the basis of how I am in life will be saying, in the event it would ever happen, I'm afraid I wouldn't be offering it up in any way. Mm. I'd be saying, you know, as soon... And I think that, I think yeah. that, that gives people, to, to my mind, it gives you the freedom to spend that time with your family when you're, when you're more. But I think, it, I think that is something that maybe um, the hospice movement could, could look at a bit more. And that's why I asked the question when I was here. And this is a very kind of a basic thing, but something, and I didn't put this in my article because I thought it was nearly too basic or the dignity of it. One of the things that fascinated me and how we're all human beings and oper our biology operates in the same way, at that meeting that I attended before we did the rounds, I discovered that when you're dying, one of your main medical problems apart from pain is constipation. <laughs> and that nearly every patient that was discussed at that meeting, that that was the, you know, and I suppose... Death is a great leveller, and that's just one of the, um, you know, when you're dying, one of the most pertinent issues, which hadn't crossed, crossed my mind before that. Can I ask one other question? <laughs> the constipation notion in my head now. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Mary. <laughs> uh, no, you, you, you are quite right. Um, is about um, the, the, the view of the hospice. Is the hospice for the dying or for the living? This it's silence. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a perception it's a bolt, I think. that it's there for the dying. Yeah. And undoubtedly, that is an element of what we do. 60% um, of our patients um, will die here in the hospice. I'm writing that stats, Stephen. Aren't I? I'm looking at Stephen. I'm, Stephen's our stats man. But 40% of our patients will get home. Patients come in for symptom control for a period of one to two weeks to maximise their symptoms, to improve their quality of life, to be at home with their loved ones. People come in for respite for a break and people come in for rehabilitation. Very important. So while 
while yes, a huge part of what we do is care of the dying, it's also about the care of the people who are still living. Mm. Mm. Okay, I just, I just thought it very important to say that. And it's not always about cancer either. No, no. And probably important to say so that. So 70% of the patients we see in the community have cancer diagnosis, so 30% don't. Whereas in the inpatient unit, it, it's slightly more have, have, can, have cancer diagnosis. And that's sometimes because of the complexities of their symptoms that they need to be admitted. But it can be about heart failure. And I, I'm not sure what other conditions. Yes. So but the, the My auntie was in here for a period of time for, and she had motor neurons. So and yeah. she was here for respite and yeah. she got out and she's yeah. doing great at the moment, yeah. thank God. But yeah. no doubt she might have another sure. stent back here. That's yeah. Mary. Yeah. I mean, again, I, my experience was so many years ago and it's extraordinary to me how all of that aspect has developed here hugely. Mm. As I said, one old building and, you know, we're told, as I was, it's about you, it's about the family, it's about everybody and exactly what you're saying, whenever a young couple needs a bit of privacy, you'll get your privacy mm -hmm. and all of that was so well developed then but all the external sort of the add-ons in terms of what is now a huge part of you do, the education here, all the other therapies, the holistic mm. therapies, you know, that to me, how that whole hospice movement has developed over the last 30 years is just mind-blowing. It's incredible. And the understanding of the whole person, the whole family, the mm. community, the, you know, and that yeah. being a part of the care. Yeah. So is it about the living or the dying? I think it's hugely about the living, mm. as I perceive it now. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about the death. Uh, uh, is the death, Robert, for the living or the dead? It's for both as well, yeah. I suppose. You know, um, like as I said before, every single funeral is different. And whether that's an at-need funeral where someone has passed away or a pre-need where someone is starting to contemplate. But the funeral just is... Um, I, you see, no matter what, every funeral is different. And whether you're dealing with a natural death, where that might be an elderly person who has lived a long life, and that process can be very different to maybe dealing with a tragic funeral where a young person has been killed or, you know, they haven't had uh, any expectation of that death. So um, Suicide. Suicide so as well. And for, unfortunately, for you and for the family that you're well, dealing with. Well, unfortunately at the moment, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Mary, because suicide is just, it's... It's unfortunate. We've done a lot of suicide funerals this year and it's just unfortunate. It's creeping. It's getting higher and higher. And I just don't think it's been talked about enough. Mm -hmm. And um, again, for the families, like I go away after meeting a family who are going through that. Like it's that initial shock where I'm meeting them that they they're so confused. They're, they may there may be guilt. There's a lot that was unsaid. You know, there's those unanswered questions. And again, mm -hmm it's such a vulnerable place for that family to be in. And um, like there's many people who I reconnect with in families that are going through suicides because I'd worry about them because now all of a sudden that might become an option of how they might die, whereas they might not have thought about that before. And um, I think just society at the moment, we're very good at the aftercare of suicide and looking mm. after families. And there's, there's plenty of support yeah. out there, yeah. but... It's that conversation, and how do we get that conversation starting about, about prevention? Prevention, yeah. and just yeah. talking about that a little bit more, yeah. um, because it's just there's. Whereas years ago they would have said there would have been nearly a certain type of person who would do that. <coughs> I mean, that has I, I remember from years ago, and I grew up in a small rural area, and I think as most people of a certain generation will know, uh, you know, somebody who died by suicide wasn't even buried in the sacred ground and I, I, many years ago now when I started working in RTE so it's you know it's 25 or 6 years ago a colleague died by suicide and I remember being infuriated going to his funeral because the priest never mentioned him mm. we had a, a funeral mass and he was never mentioned because of course he died by suicide and that, and we that didn't has talk changed about it. A and that has bit, changed a little bit only a little bit. like mm -hmm. priests are becoming a lot more well some of them are yeah. starting to dive into that and they're very yeah. understanding but again it's how the family members are dealing with that and yeah. coping with it like it was only some years ago where some of the coroner's offices so when you get your death certificate yeah. it wasn't even said mm -hmm. on the death certificate mm -hmm. and that was out of respect for the family because they didn't want to nearly put that on paper, you know, yeah. and maybe was that the right thing to do? I don't know, but that has 
that has started to change and you do see it now on death certificates and thankfully I say people when a suicide funeral is happening they're taking that opportunity to you know it's an, it's okay not to be okay you know it's yeah. it's okay to want to talk to somebody you know don't do maybe let this not be the option for you you know because I've done some very tragic young mothers, young men, you know, just in the last number of weeks alone. And yeah. again, they do sit with you for a long time. And I feel what I get to see in those situations, because it is all that, the unsaid, the, the questions, the why, the wonder. Sure. It's just, it's a very, it's just not a nice place. It's the energy is so different and it's just... I just wish there was less of it, and I think we all do, but how can we do that? How can we make that happen? Could I just oh, mention yes, something, on. Mary? Yeah, um, one of the contributors to the book who've written a beautiful letter, um, Elman Fionbar Walsh, they're the parents of Donal Walsh, the young lad on the late, late. And, and there was he, that beautiful young man, you know, coming to the end of his life with cancer, and all he wanted to do was call attention to the suicide among young people. Mm. And his parents have really carried on the work and they've set up a foundation and it is all about suicide awareness, particularly for young people. But they were just, they're wonderful contrib contributors and their, their letter is absolutely beautiful. It's saying to Donald that they're carrying on his work. I think that it hits on an important part uh, thing there as well. And I, I would completely agree with what you say about suicide. Uh, and actually earlier in the week, I chaired a parliamentary forum on mental health. Mm. Uh, that was organised by the county and it was wonderful because um, all of the TDs and senators were invited but also various groups and charities from around the country but just to see it um, being addressed and obviously suicide was mentioned a number of times you know but to see so it wasn't it was also I suppose it was acknowledging that our elected representatives can, their mental health can suffer but also just sort of bringing it more you know front and centre and discussing it but you mentioned there about priests and masses and all that I think we're in for an awful shock even in the next five years even if you're not religious as I'm not the lack of priests that I think any of us find and I've been to so many funerals in recent years the comfort in the ritual how priests can be amazing at that time and how you don't actually feel you know, and I think particularly for me, I would relate because I'd often go to um, uh, cremations in, in Dublin, I suppose. But when it's funerals at home, it's an absolute part of that ritual. And that's going to change the landscape in Ireland, I think, an awful lot. In no, the next I think couple you're right. I think people are in for a really and I think big shock on that. Robert, you said it earlier. There's huge change in the last five years in well, the, the way you're doing funerals. Well, there is. And again, it is that... Um, I suppose now there's, off, there's a lot of people who just are, are understanding they have a choice when it comes to what kind of funeral they have. They don't have to follow what mummy and daddy or nana and granddad said, you know what I mean? It's, we're all so different on a day to day, why not you know, embed that through your funeral, you know? So uh, civil funerals are happening a lot and uh, the venues are changing, they're not going to churches. Do you have a space in your undertaker's rooms we do. where so it can we happen have, as well? We yeah. have a space um, because we've been asked now to put um, Skype cameras in yeah. and we have Skype cameras mm. in all of our parlours that mm. uh, now we've one particular, it's a bigger space than a lot mm. of our funeral homes but if you would like you can hold a service yeah. in there and you can take over the place, do whatever you want mm. with it. Um, and again, you'd have people linking in through the TV systems that we have, through the cameras. They could be adding to the service. It's just, it's so different. Yeah. And again, we do whatever we can to bring out the personality and of that You know person. the way in Ireland we've been saying we're, we're slow to talk about death. We're also slow to talk about money around death. Yeah. And, uh, well, I suppose and the cost of a funeral. And I suppose what yes. I'm saying to you is you might largely know the financial circumstances of people who come to you. Mm. And I think we're slow to say, well, actually, I can't afford the 5,000 euro coffin. I really should be getting a coffin for 1,000 euro. How do you broach that? Do you, do you advise people? And you, you get a lot of, of, of flack for it, not yeah. you personally, but undertakers, for the cost of, See, of, of again, funerals. What we try to do is, there is a funeral for everybody, okay? Yeah. And again, I don't go into a shop where I can't afford an item in a shop. I go into a shop where I can afford an item, and that's just it. And I know what my affordable level is. Now, you do have families who have put aside money for funerals, and maybe insurance plans are there, but that's not as much as it was maybe 10, 20 years ago. So again, we would be very 
open with people and again, don't overspend, don't get yourself into a position where you might not be able to afford it because that brings an element of, if you're not able to, if you end up spending a large amount of money on a funeral that you can't afford, you won't ever be able to pay. You might not be able to grieve that person's death until that is gone yeah. from your... It's adding you know, another burden, another so layer of, we of would worry never and difficulty. oversell anything. And mm. again, we know, I suppose just in the experience that we have when we meet a family, you know, and we do talk about payment. Mm. It yeah. has to be talked yeah. about. And how do you plan mm. on paying for this? Or maybe mum or dad had some money set aside. Mm. And the majority of times that conversation is okay, mm. you know, and... Mm. Uh, of course, there's going to be exceptions to that, and uh, you do then have certain communities who like to uh, maybe spend more, and you know, I would see that as a waste, but <coughs> again, that's what they see. Sometimes they see it as their last gift yeah. to their loved one, as yeah. the last present. I'll be able to buy my mum, if you understand me, mm -hmm. and they just want yeah, to do it. Yeah, it's the last work. thing I can do for exactly. him or her. So, Briefly, Mary, on my yeah. tour of the crematorium, actually, this is something that came up because people were asking, and apparently, even with advice that, look, if it's a, a cremation, obviously the coffin is going to get burned. There are some people who are just adamant. They want to spend the money on it. And that's... Mm. And, know, that, and, that, yeah, exactly. and that is that. And I suppose it brings us back a little bit to where we started out about the conversations you should be having in life. Um, your will, your living will, your wishes and so on. And it brings it really into focus how we should all think about what we want afterwards. And it avoids possibly are still disharmony in families as well later on and um, just let's stay with the hospice here a minute because I'm, I'm just wondering how you deal with so much death here and how you deal with uh, looking after yourselves you know looking after your staff I think we'd be very conscious of, of that bear you know that we need to mind ourselves yeah. I think I think one of the the, the huge blessings in a way of working here is because you see so much debt, you value life. Like I mm. often walk out at the end of the day, stand on the grass and think the grass is green, the sky is blue, mm. take a deep breath, you know. And I think it teaches you to value simple things in life, you know. So, uh, I mean, we're a staff that while we all go on holidays, whatever, it's not about the holiday or the cruise. It's more about our lived lives. We mm. celebrate, you know, each other's lives and children and grandchildren. And, you know, we're very conscious of living ourselves mm. in many ways. But we have a, we've a lot of mechanisms in place to try and care for ourselves. So I run some of the mindfulness groups <coughs> in the hospice. Joan's very involved in running what are called Schwartz rounds where we gather to look at the experience of the work on ourselves. So we've, we've a number of different mechanisms that we'd use and we have an employee assistance program, you know, so people have the option of going for counselling and talking to people. We have the chaplaincy service that a lot of people would go and, and other than that, I think we've lots of subgroups. Mm. We've, you know, um, if anybody has something in common, there's a group of us that, that meet in the coffee shop to talk about having mothers yeah. in nursing homes, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. We've little yeah. subgroups. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. listening to the conversation yeah. earlier, I was wondering that very thing about Robert and your staff yeah. and how you personally deal yeah. with very death good. all day, very every day. Because what mechanisms have you to protect yourself? Yeah. Well, it's amazing. I actually, because... Ten years ago, I sadly lost a girlfriend of mine through anaphylactic fit, um, and it was very sudden. And I never thought I was going to be a funeral director, although it was my family business. But that I, I just gained a huge insight into the work the funeral directors do around that period. And again, thankfully, I myself don't... I know the job that I'm doing, and I'm very clear in what I'm doing. I care for people, but... If I care too much, I would take an awful lot of that in, if you get me. But I, I know that line I can cross. I have to stay professional for the family. But thankfully, we do have counsellors who we can depend on to go and talk to, especially this year alone, as I said, suicide has just taken a huge increase in our numbers. And again, that, that alone, I've had a couple of our staff members who have seeked help, and again... It's, it's very important that people do talk about that, you know, I think. I always think that undertakers and ambulance drivers and people like that and some care workers as well have that instant sense of ease. The minute you're in their presence, you just go, it's going to be fine now. They're going to look after things and it's a gift and obviously you have it. But it's, it's that thing of just when you're in chaos in that moment, 
sometimes you just are, are with somebody, a care worker, somebody mm -hmm. in the professions mm -hmm. who just get, makes you feel it's going to be fine. It's going to be looked after. And I've noticed that with, with, you know, some undertakers that I've had experience with and they just handle little details. Like somebody forgot their black tie and one comes out of a pocket. Yeah. There you go. And you know, it's just it's done. True. I love that mm -hmm. element of it. It's, it's going to be mm -hmm. fine. We're going to manage it. It's good. It's does gift. the fact that you work around death and dying so much, does it somehow, I don't know, help, ease, influence, how you manage, you, you talked about the death of a girlfriend there, Robert, but uh, dealing with death within your own family and your own loved ones. Joan, do you want to? I think my most immediate member who died was my father, mm -hmm. um, nearly eight years ago, and he died suddenly. And he died on his farm, and he was found on his tractor, and the tractor was still in gear. And for us, it was perfect, because not that he had died, but that he had died on the place that he loved. He couldn't understand why we went abroad when we lived in the most beautiful part of Ireland, <laughs> County Down. He, he, he died 200 metres from where he was born. Mm. And it's interesting because I came back and I thought, gosh, my patients' families in own ways are so lucky they get to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I said to my dad was that I loved him the weekend before, which yeah. was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I took great consolation in that. Um, so I thought, well, for us as a family, it's tough. But for him, it was perfect. And I remember thinking at his wake, because it's interesting, your story, Alison, because there's this huge tradition in our family that you wake, and Dad came from a, a family of 11, so you can just imagine. Um, and there was great comfort in that, so mm. there was, and that was really Im important. Um, and so for us, it's, it, it, I suppose, it's, I'm, I'm waffling now, but it, I suppose it was that immediate connection with, oh my gosh, this is, this is death in, it, in its reality, and, mm. and that finality. Um, and so, Did it help, though, that you he do would, the he work would, you do? He, he, I think it gave me an appreciation that I maybe didn't have mm. before. Mm. Um, and I did struggle when I came back to work. I thought, why are my patients, are this lady still alive? You know, she wants to die. My dad didn't want yeah, to die. Yeah, but then conflict. again, I knew my dad wouldn't have done well in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And interesting, I'll just share one, one, one comment before you, you move on. Um, he grew up in a family of 11 and we knew that his eldest brother had died of cancer at a very young age. And my dad had shared a, a room with him. And the story was that his brother had died in agony with no pain relief. Mm. And my dad was a man of few words. And my aunt said, he was so proud that you went into palliative care because he knew you would make a difference. Oh. So for me, I would never Sounds have lovely. heard that yeah, yeah. apart from being at the wake. So yeah. I think there is, I think as the panelists have said, the, that tradition that we may lose, but for some people it's so important yes. and can bring uh, of great comfort as well. Yeah. We're actually coming. Do you want to have a final word on that, Ursula? Yeah, we're we're coming to the end of of, of this session. Thank you to everybody for taking part. Orla sent around, if you remember, the front covers for her book. There are two beautiful covers, and here, uh, here they are. Um, one, the the little boat tied up, as I remember, and the other, the the flowers in bloom. Thank you very much. Um, how would you like to do this, Orla? Well, it's really just to ask for a view. Sorry, yes. Thank you. Every the the book right. will be out in the spring and all the proceeds of it are going to the hospice. Um, Alan Hatton, the designer, gave his time, the publisher, everybody's giving their time to, to bring this out and hopefully it'll make an impact and make a difference. As I said, the letters are very poignant, but they're also funny, they're uplifting, they're strong, they're resilient, they're wonderful, they're absolutely wonderful and more to come in, but we have plenty. But anyway, the two covers, either the spring flowers or the uh, boat going into the lake. So could I have a show of flan hands for the spring flowers? Can we vote? Yes. Yes, please too. Oh, I think that's most and the boat. Oh! Oh, no, it's the boat! <laughs> Did anyone vote twice? No cheating now. <laughs> so it's the boat, is it? The boat, the boat has it. There you well go. Well done. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all very much. Let me say a big thank you to all the panellists. 
I have really enjoyed this morning. I've learned a lot. Thank you for sharing so many personal anecdotes as well as your professional experience. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, thank you, Jan, for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate it because I've got a lot out of it. And I should hand back now to Audrey. Okay. Just wait for some sound to happen over here. So look, thank you so much to Mary, particularly because I think um, she's brought us through some very, very detailed and thought provoking conversations in such a short space of time. I don't know um, how you feel. For me, time certainly flew and I could have sat here all evening. Very resentful having to go back to work and I'm sure some of you are going on with your day. Um, so it was very skillfully done and it really opened up the discussion and brought us forward and back into a lot of different areas. I'd like to also thank our panellists. Um, you know, I think for people to come and share their personal experiences, but also do so in such a way that was both interesting and insightful. Um, it certainly made me laugh and nearly cry. I struggled having to get back up here, hearing some of your conversations, um, particularly from Alison and Orla. And from Robert's perspective, I think, you know, we see these undertakers, we write the check to them. We know they're there quietly supporting. But to hear from him today how much they're feeling for us as well was certainly something I'll take away into the future. Um, I'd also like to thank Ursula and Joan as my colleagues. I couldn't be more proud of them today. Um, I'm proud on a regular basis, but in terms of what they've given to this session and certainly, um, again, from a personal perspective, what they've brought into the room. So very proud of you both. I'm very proud to work alongside them as my other colleagues out there and volunteers in the, organ uh, in the audience. I suppose the subject, I need to thank the team in fundraising and communications who initially brought it to the table and realised and recognised it was such an important discussion. Um, I think for all the participants here today and why I know you were a quiet audience, I think we all participated in different ways. So I think I'll thank them for the organisation and the work that went into this. But equally to thank you for continuing to support us and participate in this, uh, these events. We seem to ask more and more of the people that are familiar with us, both staff, people that do donate to us, people that input as volunteers. So we appreciate you taking the time. Um, on a personal note, I'm not too sure if I need to go home and lie down and think about the topic. <laughs> Run and find us list or write a will, or else go and grab my parents and make sure that they've talked about it enough or they've written it. So thank you for that. Again, a special thank you to Massey Brothers Funeral Directors. I know Robert's here today, but in general, in terms of their support of this event and their ongoing support of the organisation. And again, just a round of applause for these people who have put themselves on the line for today. Thank you.